Namaskar and welcome to the fifth episode of the podcast. I hope that it will continue to inspire our budding lawyers to strive for excellence and be more socially aware as well as responsible citizens. Joining us today is Mr. Dares Khambata, senior counsel practicing before the Bombay High Court as well as the Supreme Court of India. Throughout his illustrious career, Sir has appeared in several important landmark cases and has held two distinguished public law offices, that of the Advocate General of Maharashtra and of the Additional Solicitor General of India. Sir is a specialist and an expert in uh, a variety of areas of practice ranging from constitutional and administrative law to securities and corporate law and arbitration. Sir, it is our absolute privilege and honor to host you uh, today for the podcast. And I apologize for breaking the rule of the bar because I'm calling you, sir, again and again. Glad, glad to be with you. Thank Hope you. Sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. So, so the first question is, um, what really motivated you to pursue law at the first place? That, that's a difficult question because there wasn't one magic moment where I suddenly decided I wanted to be a lawyer. I, my family has, has had legal traditions, both my grandfathers. Uh, one was a solicitor, one was a, a, a district judge for his entire career as an ICS judge. Uh, my father was at the bar for a few years before he joined industry. So I've had those uh, interactions with the law, but I was never never pressured to go into it. And frankly, I did my LLB uh, with the view that I could use that as a base degree to do something else after that. Uh, it's I think when I started mooting actively, when I was in government law college, and actually then when I got admission to the master's program at the Harvard Law School and attended that, that my mind suddenly opened up to the possibilities. And especially at, at the Harvard Law School, uh, you understand what law actually is uh, and, and, and how fascinating a subject uh, it can be. Uh, and, and therefore, I think that's, that's what clicked for me. And of course, thereafter I came back, joined the bar, and then sort of the story goes on from there. Yes, sir. So that was going to be my next question as well, that once you completed your LLM, uh, you actually joined back the chambers of the legendary Iqbal Chagla, sir. And uh, later on in your career, you also appeared against him in several matters. So how was your experience working with him as a junior and then later on, you know, uh, being an opposing counsel? And I've, I've said this before that I don't think I could have got a better senior uh, than Mr. Chagla. Uh, and I think apart from several other things, he taught me two things. And he always taught by example, he never lectured. So you just picked it up by osmosis, but it was right there staring you in the face. The first was that winning a matter or even holding on to a brief was not the important thing. The important thing was to do a good job and to do it honestly and to take your role as an officer of the court seriously. That's the first lesson I think he taught all of us. And the second he taught us the lesson that there's really much more to life than law. And it's, it's strange because I value this lesson as much as the first because you'll find as, as a lawyer, you'll be a better lawyer if you have other interests, first of all. But even apart from that, I think you'll be a better human being if you have interests outside of the law. It's very important. So th that, that's what I value from him. He was a great senior and I still turn to him for advice. And as an opponent now, he's formidable. Uh, you, you know, you can't take anything for granted. So, and it's always a fair, tough fight, which is good. All right. Uh, so I also wanted to ask you this, that you've held distinguished public law offices. Uh, how crucial do you think it is to uh, draw a balance between what the public interest demands and you know what is required to be done otherwise, which may be the instructions of the state or the center? 
Uh, and how do you think it is different? I mean, that sort of practice, how is it different from, you know, the normal practice? I, I think that's a very, very important question. Uh, and I think over the years, all of us have lost sight of what the role of a law officer should be. Uh, a law officer is an officer for the state or for the union, as the case may be. He is not really the lawyer for his client, the executive government of that state or union. And that's a, it's a huge distinction to be made. He's really, really like a custodian of the public interest. Now, that's not to say that he doesn't have to fight very hard for his client, who is the government of the day. But that does tell us that his duty to fight hard is limited by his duty as an officer of the court. That is always so for all of us lawyers, but as an example to the rest of the bar. So he has to go that extra mile uh, and he has to always keep in mind that it's the public interest that he really serves first. And if he finds that his instructions are contrary to the public interest, I know it's difficult, but it's his duty then to act in the public interest. And if he finds that there is a, a conflict between his instructions and his duty, which he can't resolve, he could either step out of the matter and return the brief, or in an extreme case, he could resign. But he must never allow himself to become a tool of his client, never allow himself to become a spokesman for his client, he has to maintain uh, that very, very clear Lakshman Rekha, that he, which he cannot cross, that he appears there for the abstraction of the union or the state and for the public interest. He or she, I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> there are very significant and, and very successful law officers uh, who, are, who are ladies. <clears throat> Thank you for clarifying that, sir. I think that was much needed. I remember, My next I, I must give yes. you an example, actually. When I yes. was Advocate General, uh, and there was a time when, because of a legal argument I'd made in court, I was facing a breach of privilege motion uh, in the assembly. And uh, there was an all-party meeting held. And it, during that meeting, I made the point that I considered myself the Advocate General for the state not for one party or for one government or the other. And I think that was appreciated. And in fact, a few days later, uh, the people who had moved that motion actually withdrew it uh, or let it drop. Uh, and I think that was appreciated. A few months later, I was reminded of that by some of the then opposition leaders. And they said, you've made a statement of which the government is not abiding by. And remember you told us that you are an advocate general for the state? And I said, yes, I did. And they said, will you stand by our statement? I said, not only will I stand by it, but I'll address a letter to the government saying it's brought to my notice that this is not being abided by. And you must stand by this statement, which I did. So, you know, I, I think it's, once you set that example, it actually helps right down the line. All your panel lawyers get that courage. The bureaucrats, who are the backbone and spine of administration in our country get that courage. It's very important. So that is truly inspiring. And uh, actually, this is one question which I wanted to ask you since a long time. And this is about online research and the prevalent of you know all these databases. Because you always tell your juniors and interns for that matter, to first read a good book, get hold of a book, you have an amazing library, and then try and you know research things uh, online. Uh, do you think that today's generation, our generation, so to say, is completely reliant on online research? And uh, like, what's your take on this, this entire issue? Of whether it's a book or whether it's online, it's a research tool. Never let a tool become your master. So. The first thing is, do you know enough about the subject, really know enough about the subject to phrase your search query? Do you know all the possible angles and all the possible words that could exhaust uh, your query on a particular topic or issue? I don't think any lawyer worth his salt should be saying, yes, I know everything. 
uh, the advantage of a good book, and it's and I and I qualify this only a good commentary. There, there are hundreds of books uh, which are not worth picking up, but a good commentary, a well-recognized commentary, will give you two or three advantages. One is you've got an expert mind who's gone through perhaps several editions, who's collated and brought all that research together for you in one place to start with. So you're starting with 80% of your research all analyzed in one place. Why would you ignore that and prefer to punch in your own query? Doesn't make sense. Two, uh, you will learn about that topic and perhaps learn things you were unaware of and which will then help you fashion and make your query more sophisticated when you actually, because you must do online research as well, otherwise the field is too vast. And the third, and actually the most important point, is that when you read a good commentary, you read around a topic. You can't be so narrow as to just look up that simple line of research. You have to understand what that principle of law is. You have to understand the different angles. You may get ideas from a book. You'll never get that out of a computer. So, uh, I think it's a no-brainer, actually. But for some reason, uh, it's uh, you know rarely done. But I, I would I would highly commend that. A combination of the two, starting with a good commentary. Thank you for clarifying that, sir. And what I take from this is that never let any tool master you. Uh, so yeah. Now, sir, another thing is that you have such a positive work culture at your chambers all the juniors and the staffers are so warm and welcoming. Uh, do you think that the work culture as such in a legal office, it could be a chambers or a law firm, uh, but it can have an impact on the mental health of lawyers? And what do you think are the broad factors that influence or affect the mental health, health of lawyers? Again, a very good question because I know young lawyers uh, sometimes feel completely lost when they're thrown into our system. Uh, and there's, there's this fundamental distinction between the way juniors operate in Delhi and the way they operate in Bombay. In, Del in Delhi, they're actually employed by their senior. They get a monthly stipend, uh, which is a good thing. It helps a junior to start. In, in Bombay, that's not generally the practice. Uh, on the other hand, a Bombay senior allows far more freedom to his or her juniors. Uh, they allow them to appear against the senior if necessary in a matter. Uh, so that's that, that freedom allows growth. Now, uh, I'm not into evaluating which is the better system. Maybe a hybrid might work better, but I think it's important for a junior to feel secure. The bar is a very insecure place. And let me tell you, lawyers of any seniority, even of the highest seniority, always feel a little insecure at the bar. So you've got to make a, a junior feel that he has a, a security blanket that he can effectively come home to every day from court. You have to give him that security. And uh, that may be in, in the form of friendly advice. It may be in the, he may ask your guidance on a law point. It may be a personal matter. And if, you're, if the atmosphere in your chambers is not comfortable and easygoing, uh, you're not adding to his sense of security, or probably adding to his insecurity. So that's not the right thing to do. And I myself joined a chambers where we were encouraged to be informal, casual. We built a relationship with our senior. Uh, we were irreverent. Uh, there was no no formality. We were never rude or offensive, but we were we never gave we never sort of we were never obsequial to our seniors. And I've tried to encourage the same atmosphere in my chambers. After all. However, junior a lawyer is, he's still a professional, he or she is still a professional in his or her own right, and you have to respect that. Indeed, sir. Uh, so the next question is about the pandemic and the new normal. So as you know, COVID-19 has pushed us to the new normal and virtual courts. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, because I'm sure you would have appeared in some virtual hearings, uh, how has your experience been? And do you think that the virtual courts are here to stay? I've appeared, I think 90% of my appearances or more during the last year have been in virtual hearings. And I've had really very, very satisfying experiences. I think as sometimes crises do, they, they give us, uh, they, there's always a silver lining. 
And in this case, the silver lining is that virtual hearings actually work. They work with a little discipline. They work with a little self uh, etiquette and, and uh, a procedural, some procedural compliances, but they do work. Uh, I've had, I've argued very complex matters virtually. Uh, a couple of months ago, I did uh, an international arbitration where we were traversing five time zones where people scattered all over the place. The tribunal was not sitting together. Your legal team was not together. We had, I cross-examined a witness uh, across two continents in a, you know, about across five time zones. Um, and it went very smoothly. Nobody but nobody felt that we were lacking in anything. I understand that that eye contact, there's nothing to substitute eye contact and a physical presence. But that can be made up in a number of ways in a virtual hearing. And I don't think the matter lost out at all. And I don't think the client suffered at all uh, for having that virtual hearing. So that's, my, that's been my experience in courts across India. Uh, and the, uh, the, one of the advantages, of course, of virtual hearings is that lawyers can now appear in any courts. Uh, lawyers from across the country can appear in the Supreme Court, which is how it should be, because it's the Supreme Court for the whole of India. Uh, and uh, you can appear in different high courts. Why shouldn't the client get the best possible representation when and where he or she wants it? So I think there are advantages. I think even after the pandemic, a court should look at virtual hearings uh, in a methodical way. I can't say that they'll substitute physical hearings. They probably shouldn't. Uh, but at least in smaller matters, for mentionings, for production matters, for urgent matters, all that can be shifted to the virtual platform. Uh, and, and I think that will be cost effective. It will be in, encouraging of the bar. I don't think we are at a stage where we can say that uh, most lawyers can't afford one device uh, to be heard virtually. I think most can. And where they can't, bar, local bar associations must make available facilities so they can log on. Uh, internet is, I agree, is not uniformly good, but these are problems one has to work on. But I think virtual hearings are, are here to stay. Uh, they add value to the system. They can help us in getting rid of arrears. Uh, and I don't think we should just brush them aside because actually the more you appear in virtual hearings, the more you realize that unless your fundamentals are good, they don't work. So you have to be better prepared. You have to make your written submissions in advance. You have to have your list of dates ready. You have to file things in advance. You really can't and shouldn't ambush your opponents with, with, with judgments pulled out of a hat. Uh, so I think it, it actually makes for better justice. All right, sir. Thanks for your views on virtual courts. This is something which I think a lot of people are interested in. Uh, and now I want to ask you, I firstly want to tell you that and I'm sure you would also know this. You, sir, are a role model for lawyers and law students and the legal fraternity. That's but kind of you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I was keen to know that who has been your role model in the field of law, apart from Mr. Chagla, of course. So it's difficult to say because many people have guided me and advised me for different phases of my life. But I think if I had to pick three, and no disrespect to anyone else, because they have, I've, I've had a lot of good value and guidance from others as well, uh, I would, of course, say my senior, Iqbal Chagla, uh, Mr. Nariman, Fali Nariman, uh, has been a great influence uh, on my professional life. Uh, and H.M. Uh, Sirvai, who I had the opportunity of working with when I was really a, a ranked junior. And he gave a lot of respect to all of us. He, he worked hard. He set an example. The man of great standards, integrity. Uh, and I, it was fascinating working with him as indeed it's been fascinating working with Mr. Nariman and Mr. Chagla. Uh, and I think these three would be my sort of goal, sort of goals to achieve uh, role models uh, in my professional career. Uh, personally speaking, of course, my, my hero has always been my father uh, because he exemplified 
qualities that I think are the most valuable. A highly intelligent uh, and civilized man, but never showed off. Almost diffident, low key. Was successful, but never blew his trumpet. Uh, and I think for me, those are values that are far more valuable than anything else. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, lastly, any parting words or wisdom for our lawyer, uh, for our students and and budding lawyers watching this podcast? Anything that you know, you'd like to share? Asked, when anyone asks me to give words of wisdom, I feel terribly <laughs> old because I think that's uh, and and I still feel sometimes that I've just joined the bar. I don't feel that I've had so many years. So all I so, can so say I would is, rephrase it as a friendly advice. <laughs> So, okay, what I would say is this, you know, go about your own life, even in, at the bar with your own principles and try and stick to those principles. Often you'll have to make sacrifices and choices, which no one will know about. They'll go unacknowledged, uh, but it matters not. Just do the right thing, even if you have to do it quietly uh, and expect that life and the profession will deliver a few hard knocks to you. It's not possible to go through it smoothly. So the real test is how well you recover from a knock, whether you dust yourself off and get up and, and go on about your purpose uh, as effectively as you did before the knock. I think that's really the, the, the test. So go out. It's a great profession. I think it's, it's, it's a great profession in India today. There's so many opportunities. We can improve so many things. Uh, so go out and do your best. Thank you so much, sir. Firstly, thank you for taking out time from your busy schedule and agreeing to do this. And if there are if there were any mistakes, I apologize because I'm also still very new to doing all of this. And uh, it's always, always, always a pleasure to interact with you, sir. Thanks for joining. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Shivan. Thank you, Harsh. Bye. Bye.